Hey there. Hello, hello, and welcome to 100% BS with Bella Solonat. I am your host, Bella Solonat. How is it going? Thank you for being here today. I am really, really excited about this episode. Guys, this has been one I have been waiting for for a couple months, and I'm just ecstatic about how the conversation went and feel so happy with it. It was so beautiful and I'm going to let the conversation speak for itself but I just wanted to say hello first and thank you for being here and taking the time to listen. Um, If you're new to the show, welcome. I'm so glad to have you. This is 100% BS and this is my show where I look at society and culture and current events through a lens of communication, growth, wellness, relationships, and a little bit of spirituality too. And I love having conversations that hopefully push the edge of what we know and kind of expand us into something new, something different, something a little bit uncomfortable, something where we are questioning what we think we know. That's kind of the space that I like to hang out in. Um, And I am so grateful for all the people that take the time to listen here. If you listen to the show, share it with a friend that you uh, think would enjoy it. Share it on Instagram. Tag me while you're listening. I'd love to see what you're up to while you are tuning in, what your thoughts are. DM me. Let me know. Um, And if you have a long-winded thing that you want to tell me about, you can email podcast at bellasolonot.com. I'll put all of that in the description. Um, But yeah, thank you guys so much. Let's dive into the episode. And if you want to connect with me, you can go to at bellasolonot. You can also go to bellasolonot.com. I just launched my website. It's very exciting. That's the place where you can really get to know me and my work and everything that I do. So yes. And lastly, if you enjoy this episode, if you enjoy the podcast, please give it a rating on Spotify and Apple podcasts. It takes two seconds on Spotify. And if you have an extra 30 seconds and you want to leave a, leave a written review on Apple podcasts, that would be amazing. Okay. Let's dive in. I know you guys are dying to hear this one. Okay. See you on the flip. But yeah, I'm, I'm really hoping with this conversation today, the reason I'm so excited is because I think um, I think everyone is kind of obsessed with like relationships. I, I was watching one of your your amazing TED Talks and it's like so true that we really all secretly are trying to figure out how to do this whole thing. But for me personally, I a lot of the work I do is like this intersection of communication, relationships, how are you relating to reality? How are you taking in this information? How are you having the conversation? And then also bringing in these like elements of, you know, spirituality and like, what's our place in all of this? How do you feel more grounded, right? Like, I I really think it's all connected. And I've been loving seeing the work that you're doing because you have this way of kind of connecting the relationship human connection piece of it that a lot of people aren't seeing. And in particular, I remember just seeing you explain in the context of the last two years with COVID pandemic, like all of these new dynamics we're dealing with and explaining to people from your perspective, what's happening here? Like, how do you break it down? Right. And so what, what I want to do first before we dive into all that fun stuff is just for you to kind of give your uh, a bit of your your story and how you got to the place you are now. But particularly, I think what's interesting uh, in your story is, I don't know if you share about it much, but you used to work in pharma as a sales rep, I think, correct? And um, yeah. in addition to that, you know, all the other life experience you've had leads you to the expert that you are today. But I'm so curious just to let you sort of give that background and give that story of how these experiences um, have led you to where you are now and how you feel this like fire in you to speak about these issues that so clearly have to do with what's at stake here, what's at stake with, you know, humans, the way they relate to each other and the way that we move forward. Mm, What a delicious subject. Uh, You know, you never realize, you know, and I think that's why when we're in the midst of the shit, the storm, the breakdown, whatever it is, 
the grief, the loss, you don't realize where it's taking you. You know, you don't realize uh, how everything that has come into your life is really inviting you to be shaped, to build skills, to prepare. I mean, you could see the world differently, right? Like you could see the world as if none of it really matters and we're just a bunch of meat sacks hanging out on a place you know, having sex, making more meat sex. And, you know, I know that's not the romanticized version <laughs> that, that we'd like to have. And, and I think the romanticized version is what makes humans really distinct in that there is something more to all of this. And again, you can believe that there isn't. I just think that when we have the perspective that life is happening for you and you're being invited to shape skills and master things like really in all of your triggers is really an invitation to mastery. You know, every time you get reactive, you're actually not attending to something. Um, and it doesn't mean that we can't have reactivity or we can't have pain or we, I'm not dismissing trauma or anything like that. What I'm saying is, can we look in it? Can we explore it? Can we see what is ours and take responsibility for it? You know, um, I say all of that because I didn't really think about my own personal role or participation in my romantic relationships up until probably my late twenties. Mm. I thought about my role in relationships though. And I, I really was a romantic by, by, uh, by the time I was a teenager, for sure, you know, and my parents are, are still together. And so I really had this sort of idea that I wanted to be really able to love a woman and take care of, you know, you see the language from the shaping mm. um, of who I was supposed to be a good provider. You know, that was my goal was to be 27, get married, be a good provider. I remember thinking that when I was in grade nine, um, again, mixing into that being that I grew up Catholic and I'm since recovering Catholic, I like to say. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. <laughs> right. Like, I think we're all sort of recovering from who we are taught to be, you know, and, and so I was in sales actually, when I was in finished high school, I went to university and I took finance and I haven't used really that much since. <laughs> and the, I, st the reason I did finance is because I thought it was harder than marketing and I knew I'd be good at marketing. And I was in sales. I was working at a place called Future Shop, which is really Best Buy. Best Buy ended up buying Future Shop. So that was a nice natural fit. But when I started in sales there, I had to wear a suit every day. And we we're kind of like cheesy some extended warranties and shit. <laughs> and, you know, I learned so much about selling. Uh, that was like, a, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Boiler Room, but it was very much like a Boiler Room kind of digital, <laughs> kind of mm. like the 40-year-old virgin mixed with <laughs> Boiler Room. And, um, I mean, I learned how to hard close people. I learned nine different ways to close people to get them to buy something. I remember that. And then they moved to a more softer sales cycle. I say all of this just because it's relevant. Mm. I then moved into pharmaceutical sales when I graduated from university. My father ran the education space for cardiology at a university where I grew up. And so he was exposed to pharmaceutical reps. He said, hey, you love sales. I love all these guys that I know who work for these companies. They love their jobs. I went and worked with a guy for a day and I was like, holy shit, you get paid to do what we just did for a day. And as I was in that immersion, I also went through a breakup. And that's a common theme, I think, of all humans, but especially of my journey. I really wanted to understand. I, I felt like all love led to betrayal, led to lying, led to me abandoning myself um, in the process. And so I studied things like I read the book, The Game. You know, I read... Uh, <laughs> I forget what the other book was called, but it was about pickup artistry. And that, that really wasn't authentic to me. Um, and, you know, I laugh now when I say, like, you learn, when you're learning pickup artistry, you're just learning how to pretend to be someone who has high self-confidence. Mm. Um, but when push comes to shove, you don't. And so that will come out. Um, and I was also reading books like How to Get Anyone to Do Anything, um, How to Win Friends and Influence People. You know, you said Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Right. You know, your classic business sales stuff. And uh, when I went through a breakup in my late 20s, that's when I started to ask questions like, how did I get here? Like, why? I feel like I've been living a life that someone else taught me. Mm. I've been making choices, but I haven't been consciously making choices. Like I knew that I had chosen my way there, 
but I had felt like in some ways I was unconscious in that journey. Sure. I thought to myself, how did I get to this place where I got engaged and I didn't want to? Like, why would someone do that? Like, that was really crazy to me that yeah. I could get to this place where I was so terrified and then broke up with someone, took them on a journey with me in my uncertainty and not realizing the impact that would have on them. So I just really felt all of the consequences of being not conscious of my choices. And I really think that is the birth of awakening is sitting with the dissonance that is always around us. It's always around us. It's in yeah. the bullshit you're seeing on the news and it's in the inconsistencies in all like COVID to me was just this giant obvious. It's like right in your fucking face. Yeah. Like it is slapping you saying this doesn't make sense. And Again, I'm not negating any of the processes or protocols that might work or the effect. Of, see, when you want to discuss it, you're immediately told that you're anti-vax. Yeah. Um, which is, again, so that we don't have to have the conversation. You know, I have a friend who said to me, oh, yeah, I heard you're anti-vax. I'm like, I have every vaccine up until this one. Yeah. Like, I'm clearly not anti-vax. When the COVID began, I wanted to explore. I trained in reading clinical trials. I was like, I'm going to make this choice for me, but maybe COVID's really scary. I'm watching videos of people fall on their fucking face. I'm, you know, reading the studies on the vaccine, and I, I just couldn't – none of it was making sense to me. And I happened in my last uh, product that I represented, it happened to use the PCR test, so I knew about the PCR test. Wow. Mm. Yeah, so when the PCR test was being used to diagnose COVID, I was like, hmm, there's something up here because it's not to be used for diagnostic purposes. I knew that. Um, but I was curious. And uh, as a sales rep, I taught a consulting course on the science of influence, how to get people to change their behavior. You know, I took courses on NLP, which is neuro-linguistic programming. And that's, really, you know, coupled with marketing and all of it just created this sort of perfect storm. As I studied when my relationship ended at 27, that engagement, I started to study romantic relationships. I started to study the science of them. I went back to school and took positive psychology. I was really fascinated by, hey, we've been focusing on what's wrong with people. Let's put some science to what's right with people. What's the science of optimism and motivation? And, you know, coupled with that, I started to heal my relationship to spirituality because I did not like the word God because mm -hmm. God as a concept had been weaponized against me, but against many people and God being any uh, deity that someone's been taught to, to praise. And I started to consume things voraciously like Alan Watts and Love people who Alan made Watts. sense. Yeah. They, they like spoke sense to the world and I'd never really taken personal growth. And so I was in this sort of taking the crack of personal growth. And, you know, I, I felt like, whoa, like, why isn't everybody interested in understanding this? And I really was like, why is no one taught how to love mm. and to relate? And I thought, why am I so good at sales, but not good at love and communicating? And so I knew it was more than a skill set thing. And then I started to learn about the unconscious mind. And, you know, you learn that 95 to 99% of what you do is actually unconscious, which, of course, marketers have always known, governments have mm. always known, or, or definitely for a while, and so with COVID, I was a pharmaceutical rep for 14 years. I worked with the same company for 13, the 13 last years. The first one was a mat leave that I covered. And I've launched drugs. I've taken them off the market. When I left pharma, um, I, I mean, I learned so much in that space. And I worked with so many incredible people. That's why I never uh, shame it. You yeah. know, it's, you know, I learned a lot about people. I learned a lot about physicians. I learned a lot about human nature, um, not just from them, but from myself. And, you know, I always knew that there's a certain percentage of healthcare practitioners who don't have integrity, Sure. but that's not questioning the practice itself. It's saying that's true of the distribution of any humans in any job. Um, but what I've really found scary in the last couple of years is watching the language being used and the complete dismissal of the ability to dialogue about anything and you know i've had to really observe my own self in order to you know like really stand in what i believe in and really say like when i look back upon my life how do i want to be remembered in this moment mm -hmm. 
and integrity just became the cornerstone of my of my work and my life when I had the awareness that I was living and making choices that were not actually at the highest level of knowledge that I had. And so I made a commitment when I was 27 that I would have every conversation I didn't want to have. And that's how I got to a place so disconnected from myself. And then when I was 35, I had this awareness that I had been, or sorry, when I was 32, I had this awareness that I would learn things and then continue to choose the pain choose the thing that might have brought me momentary bliss or joy um, and and not actually go through the pain of the transformation of letting go of what is certain, whatever behavior that is, and actually beginning to stand in a place of uncertainty but alignment. And, um, you know, I have a friend, Brian Reeves, who's an incredible writer, and I remember saying to him, like, how do you just write such incredible stuff? And he said, there's I always write from the edge of my truth. Mm. There's not a moment that I have published that I'm not terrified. And I hate that, you know, because in <laughs> some way I know that uh, that was before cancel culture. You know, that was before yeah. the mob, which are all, again, um, I think indicative of our real low nervous system capacity to hold discourse and disagreement and actually be, have this idea that what we believe um, and maybe who we are, because we associate what we, we believe with who we are, um, that in some way someone disagreeing with us actually dismisses us. Yeah. And I want to be mindful that there are certainly communities that that has been true. And, and so how do we navigate with the sensitivities of that while doing reparation for whatever that context might mean um, and still dialogue yeah you know, there's a lot of subjects that are sort of considered off the table and if you bring them on the table you are told to leave the table instead of the subject you know being able to stay and us all sit in discomfort because there's not a, a person who's having conversations about things like covid at a family experience or with friends who have maybe what we'll call oppositional views who isn't uncomfortable or feeling right. not acknowledged or heard. What I think has been most toxic though, is the moralization of one position. Yes. And the moralization of that position has made it. So any criticism of that position is actually not allowed because what good people do is they believe this one thing. And if you're not good, if you don't believe that, then you're not good, which really hijacks and manipulates the human system. So that's a really long fucking answer to what God. <laughs> it was here. It was perfect because there is a big theme that happens here where number 1, we have this tendency, I do this all the time and I think you just did it too, but out of an awareness thing where we start to say a view and we automatically have to give the disclaimer because God forbid somebody's right. going to misunderstand it, right? And it's like Part of that is a good thing because you want to breathe nuance into it already. No problem with that. But on the flip side, it's like we are already operating from, from a place where we think people are going to misunderstand it because our morality is tied to a view, our goodness as a person, right. like your adherence to a certain narrative or idea means that you're good, you're invited, you were fine with you, right? And if you disagree with it, suddenly it questions who you are as a person. And right. I think actually that people replace their like religion in a way. Cause I think we've, I think before, I think a few years ago, we sort of moved away as a, let's say in the, in the U S and what Western in, in the West, we've like moved away from religion and sort of like people, a lot of people feel like the word God was very charged, very negative. The institution of religion has been really problematic for a long time. Right. And I think we replaced it with different aspects of, let's say one form could be agreeing with the science consensus. Another is agreeing with your political party, agreeing with what the people on TV are saying. Right. And if right. you don't, that's the equivalent of you're now morally bad. You're a bad person. And what I have found to be so fascinating in these conversations around, let's say COVID, for example, is 
people have good intentions. And that's what makes it so hard is because most right. people are trying their best to be respectful. They don't want, you know, there's this whole don't kill the grandma type of thing, right? Which was like basically in a way like manipulating people's sense of wanting to be good, right? Like we see you're you're very familiar with Trudeau's language and the way that he uses this it's very it gives me like the heebie jeebies because it's so clearly a manipulation in terms of you did the right thing, <laughs> right. you're a good person, so don't worry. And it's like you set that up and it trickles down into the culture, into people's families, et cetera, where people literally like view someone who disagrees as you're literally a bad person. And it's like, right. how do you how do people ever feel safe to like actually the answer is you're not going to feel safe, right? It's going to be uncomfortable, but that's where then your desire to belong and be like, I'm a good person. These people like me is going to just take over. And why bother even like having some nuance or questioning the mandate or looking into it? If the answer is going to be, if the truth is going to be something that's radically different than what you've been told. And we like grasp onto these stories and beliefs like nothing else. And it's like, you have to, play the game where you separate that and you view here's my idea and here's who I am. They don't need to be connected right now. Like how can I actually talk about it? And I think that's something really fascinating for you when you apply this lens of relationships, right? Relationships can be this beautiful ground where you do that exploratory work because with, when you're with someone and let's say the, the, like the basics of they want the best for you, you're committed to each other and something goes wrong and you need to talk about it. You need to have the hard conversation. Like what if having the hard conversation is actually what saves the relationship instead of breaking it? Or what if it actually brings you closer, right? So it's like, we're so scared to possibly be wrong. Like what if you actually having this perspective meant that you are against vaccines? Let's just hold it for a second and say, okay, what if that's true? Why can't I actually just learn more about that? Why can't I just see what you have to say instead of automatically using this random label word as a painting of who you are and moving on? And that's what people have done is they aren't even comfortable with the idea of what if it's actually true? Like, what if this is true? What if you can actually hold the humanity for this person anyway? And what would happen if you did that? And I think that's where I'd love to like kind of connect where in relationships we see these, these trends and like almost on the bad spectrum, like an abusive relationship, right? Where you're unable to bring things up or you're feeling unsafe all the time because you challenging the person is, they make you feel bad about it, right? It's like, how do you parallel parallel that between the discourse and the narratives we've seen from the media or, or whoever's in power, like in your country per se? Like, how are those kind of parallels that you've you've seen? Well, I mean, first off, you have to create nuance within your own beliefs and your own self. You have to be willing to be wrong, too. You know, like the most successful relationships are open to the influence of their partner and you know, I think one of the biggest flaws of our thinking to do with conflict in general, which I think is just heightened because we're in giant states of fear that have been, I would argue, um, quite purposefully placed upon us. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be nefarious or malicious. It's that, look, if it bleeds, it leads. In, In the research on the news, it's like there's something like 45 negativities for every one positive in successful relationships. It's five plus positives for every one negative interaction for a relationship to succeed. Anything below five to one ends in divorce. And that's based on the guidance research who are like five positive to every one negative interactions. And so really like seven, eight to one is really good. And then anything above 13, you know, they're Pollyanna kind of full of bullshit, just pretending to be positive. (laughs) So people don't trust that. They don't trust, you know, authentic positivity, much like that's why gratitude can feel so trite because it's like, oh, I'd be grateful. And you're like, there's fucking war and a bunch of shit going on. Can we also, you know, it's like this idea that 
observing the positive means we should avoid or ignore the negative. We do this with feelings too. Positive feelings are good. We've been taught that feelings like grief, sadness, anger are bad. They're not bad. They're actually just information, information that's informing you about the world and your environment and what you need to change and where you need to move. You know, this idea that a conversation, the any conversation that is based upon discovery, curiosity, finding the truth might shatter a relationship. Sure. But it, as you said, it actually is the very um, conversation that will deepen it. You know, that's the irony is the ones that break us up are also the ones that break us through. Mm. And, and, and we have to break up on some level with an old version of ourselves, the silent version of ourselves. And, you know, this fear because really what media companies and social media do is they monetize the space between your attention and what's being brought forth to your attention. So as someone who creates on Instagram, they decide they make money from what you see from me. And that's why they say, hey, if you're going to create content on Instagram, this is the kind of content that gets consumed. Then we can get more ads in front of people. And so they'll, by nature, be filtering out the people who are not willing to dance in the way they want, literally dance and point at shit because that's <laughs> what they like. Uh, and nothing wrong with that if that's your jam. Um, so just recognizing that the media really, especially in the United States, was already on a massive run from Trump and like couldn't stop talking about him because people watched the news. It sort of saved these networks. And then it just transferred right into COVID and like how they had death tickers on their screens. You know, these are all highly manipulative, really painful things for people to consume on the daily. Again, I'm not saying people shouldn't be informed. I'm saying that it's actually not healthy for a system. And when we're that afraid, we're more likely to agree to things and take on perspectives that, you know, people don't like the comparison to Nazi Germany. They get very reactive to that. But no one's saying that the lives of those people lost in Nazi Germany, the Jews, and many people, was weren't important or it devalues their lives. What they're saying is there's a pattern that occurred there, and mm -hmm. it looked kind of like the pattern that occur is occurring here. Can we just get a little curious about it? And I would argue that the statements like grandma killer or even sheep, right, because it occurs on the other side, um, and you're anti-Semitic if you bring up this point or this thought or you're devaluing, again, it's this idea that we can't talk about this thing because what are we going to discover when we talk about it? Well, first off, all the language that governments chose was by design. Justin Trudeau, Joe Biden, they didn't – just happened to say that by accident. Mm. I guarantee you those words were carefully chosen. Build back better. Do the right thing. The right thing infers that there's one thing that's right and there's another thing that's wrong. Um, be a good person. Listen, everyone unconsciously, 99.9, .9, unless you're a psychopath or a sociopath, you might not care whether someone sees you're a good person, but most people care that they're seen as a good person. And most people believe they are good people. And that's why you and I could have different views around COVID, around vaccination, around climate, around the war, around whatever it is, right? Right, left, any topic. And this idea that having different views, like in some way, <laughs> one, we put these views together. If you're right wing, you're probably anti-vax. You're probably anti-mandate. If you're left wing, you're probably pro this and you're probably cancel culture, right? Like we have all these negative associations. Mm. You're woke, you're this, you're that. All of it offers these binaries. You're either one or the other. And the world feels safer in binaries. And when we're afraid, we like certainty. And so life feels in research, in psychology, they call these decision heuristics. Really what they are is shortcuts to make decisions. So if you and I are walking down the street and all of a sudden 20 people start sprinting and yelling, we're probably going to sprint with them. We're not taking time to assess the threat. And, and that's an important evolutionary thing. But when we're constantly in fear, we don't have the capacity to bring in information. So our prefrontal cortex shuts down, even in workplaces, when someone says, can I give you some feedback? <laughs> so can you imagine watching the news all fucking day or consuming death tickers and hearing that you're going to die from COVID all the time, how are you going to take in information? 
that goes against you being a good person, right? Like you really have to be able to step out and recognize you're creating your own identity and you're able to be discerning about the information you're taking in. But to do that, you have to have capacity in your nervous system. And that's challenging. That, mm. you know, when I look at who are the people who are able to dialogue about this, not necessarily are on one state or the other, but are literally able to just sit down and have a conversation. It's usually people who have had to somehow step out of the system themselves or been harmed by the system. Mm. So if you woke up from being divorced and all of a sudden you're like, why did I stay? Why did I do it? If you were harmed by the medical industry, if you were harmed by a vaccine, if you were harmed by any drug, if you were manipulated by it, if your culture was, all of these things are going to create this level of awareness of, I don't believe everything I'm taught anymore. And it really is that, like, how do we manage to move through everything and begin to hold dissonance because that's really it do you have the capacity to be wrong you know if you're someone who got the vaccine again there's no judgment associated with that because especially if you got it because they said you're going to lose your job or you mm -hmm. wanted to get back to normal can you hold the truth that that actually is coercion like if you weren't going to get it without some consequence then you were coerced mm -hmm. that's just a straight truth like yeah. i don't know if you want to argue with that you can i don't know how you can if if like absent of this consequence you wouldn't have gotten it then the consequence motivated you to get it right like um, external consequence that somebody else put on you not like your own your job, oh i might get right. sick right. it's like not be able somebody to travel else. yeah right and all of those things means that you gave up your medical autonomy your bodily autonomy in order to participate in society. And you can't tell anybody you have the choice when the alternative to the choice is losing your job and putting food on the table. That's sure. actually not a choice. Yeah. I think we can understand that from a humanitarian perspective. But if you happen to get it, and then you happen to be exposed to information that says you might get sick, or it's not as effective as we thought, or maybe it impacts the immune system and weakens it over time, it makes it so it targets only one aspect of the virus, whatever it might be. There's lots of different side effects. You're not going to be able to take in that information for the most part because it is in conflict with the choice that you might have made under duress or you might have made to be a good person. Mm -hmm. And to be able to sit in that opposition is honestly, I think, the hardest work. And that takes a lot of humility. Like you're eating a big piece of humble pie in that. And, you know, I heard yesterday a talk where an emergency room physician was talking to the authors of the Great Barrington Declaration who have been proven quite right mm -hmm. about what they recommended at the beginning. And he said, I'm sorry. I actually thought you guys were crazy. I actually, you know, and I'm sorry, I, I didn't get it right. Mm. And, you know, and I think we're seeing that now with families as more information comes out. You know, but of course, the shift of the focus is on to the Ukraine and Russia, and I get why that is. Um, and it's it's convenient that it's at the exact same time that we really need to be holding the people who put in, like lockdowns had no data. Sure. We knew. Yeah. Like at the beginning, I said on my own podcast, these will have more costs than they will benefit. And that the only reason I could say that with confidence then was because I read the data. Yeah. You know, and listen, like anyone, you can find so much good information out there from very credible physicians. And my, you know, before we used to love Ivy League doctors, like all the three authors of the Great Barrington Declaration are from some of the top universities in the world. They are some of the top people in their field. And all of a sudden they're quacks. Mm. all of a sudden they're crazy because i think about this with any position or thought are you willing to believe the person who has everything to gain or believe the person who has everything to lose for sharing their position for me it's the latter yeah because i could trust the person who's willing if you're willing to face exile from your community from your job yeah um and give it all up for the integrity of the truth or at least nuance. I mean, that yeah. to me is admirate, you know, very um, 
uh, admirational. I don't know, one of those. Yeah. Admir- admiral. Admiral. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, like the way out is to actually cultivate more space within ourselves. It is to be able to see all the glaring oppositional views we have within ourselves to glaringly truths. You know, I think the greatest misnomer, I think I said this at the beginning, but didn't finish it about conflict is that we think that conflict navigated well means that we agree or Mm. maybe better yet, they agree with me, but really conflict navigated well is that both people feel heard. Both people feel validated because you and I can experience the exact same situation very differently and that's based on our fears and that's based on our conditioning and our lives and our what information we've consumed and that's why you know you said earlier everyone has good intentions and that's what's beautiful is like yeah. truthfully we're just all orienting around our values differently and in my experience one side has been told their orientation is wrong and the other side is being told that it's right. Um, again, though, that can switch because you get people who are told if you're wearing, someone's wearing a mask, they call them sheep. Right, you yeah. Know? So it does go in both directions. And both people actually become the same. It's kind of like in their left and right wing. Yeah. They belong to the same bird is a saying. And uh, in horseshoe theory, I mean, eventually, like, they just meet because they are both intolerant. Yeah. They just have different ways of going about it. Yeah, it's like that. Um mm-hmm. There's this uh, Frederick Nietzsche, I think so you say his last name, um, yeah, quote Nietzsche. where he's like, the I'm going to butcher it, but it's basically like the longer that you, s- like don't stare into the abyss so long that it ends up staring back at you. Like you are going, the longer that you look at darkness, complain about darkness, like fight darkness, there's a chance that it will come back to you and you will start to like envelop and and become part of that darkness. It's like the shadow thing where we like ignore and are afraid of the possibility that we have a capacity for evil. Right. Like I, I believe that. That's so important. Yes. And I, I believe that humans are inherently good. I have a feeling you have a similar outlook, but I think that a lot of times it's like we, are so afraid of that possibility of being, whether it's as simple as being wrong and you think that that's dark and bad because like that's a whole kind of belief that's been pushed on people through, you know, fear of conflict, fear of disagreement. It's like if you're wrong about something or if someone like proves you wrong, suddenly like you are like not as worthy or you're not as like whole or whatever it is. And it's like the shadow, I think this is tied to the dissonance thing. It's like, how can you actually sit with the discomfort of like, I, I hurt this person or I fully messed up here, or I was completely convinced of this story just because somebody told me to. And I, you know, I didn't actually think about it. I didn't actually choose this for myself, right? Somebody else told me to do it. And it's like, We had this discomfort with the shadow, the darkness, like the pain. And in that we forget that that's kind of the answer. Like the symptom, the pain of all of that is where you're going to find the ability to hold greater love and to like expand towards more light. And I think for people who have that fear of conflict, it's like, let's say in the context of a relationship, like how people can find the comfort, like the grounding in themselves. Cause I think part of this is when you are afraid of the shadow of being wrong, of being perceived as bad or whatever it is, I think that's a lack of you being sort of like there for yourself, like that, you know, you like, I'm, I don't need this person to like me. I don't need them to agree with me because my value is not placed on them approving of me. Right. So it's like, I think that's an interesting piece to explore for people is if you feel like you're afraid to enter these conflicts, to enter these conversations, these disagreements, what's a way that you can find the comfort in yourself and sort of like prove to yourself, like I'm, fine anyway like even if I don't receive the love and admiration from this person or the mainstream agreement like I'm still whole like I still 
stand here as a valid, worthy human being. Just, and it doesn't matter if the other people don't like me, right? Like that's such a hard thing, I think, for Look, people to sit that's in. The hardest. That's the hardest. I mean, that's the work. That's that's healing codependency. That's the hardest work because codependency says I need you to be needed. Mm. You know, I need it. Interdependency is two sovereignties living together. You know, really the healthiest relationships are two individuals that are creating something separate from themselves, but they don't trade in their individuality to be part of something else. Um, you know, Gabor Mate talks about how all humans have two needs. They have the need for self-expression and authenticity and the need for belonging. But when self-expression threatens belonging, belonging wins. And I would say till it doesn't, because this idea that if I speak out or I share my frustration or my hurt or whatever it might be, and someone doesn't agree with it or calls me a name, then I must be that. Like I now have not been validated. I've been actually exiled or criticized or whatever it might be. So how I feel about me is determined by how they feel about me, which is really how humans have evolved. So, you know, it's like, if someone's listening and they're like, I do that. Welcome. Because everybody <laughs> does it till they don't. <laughs> exactly. So this isn't about not having care or concern for the impact of our words and ways of being on other people. It's about can we discern between, you know, valid feedback, you know, because someone could tell me I'm a name and I can sit with myself and be like, hmm, is that true? Is it not? But that takes a lot of work. That takes this space of individuation. That takes the space of, hey, what you've chosen in your life, did you choose it from an authentic place or are you choosing it because you were taught to choose it? And there's nothing wrong with that, but like you just have to get really real with yourself. You know, every time I'm frustrated, hurt, ever, whatever it might be, do I silence myself to protect the people around me? Do I silence to protect myself? Now, we have to be obviously mindful if there's like abuse or anything like that. You have to get it's help to get out of that type of thing if it's not safe. But And a lot of the times our perceived sense of threat, let's call it, like they won't like me, they won't, they won't like me, they won't this, they won't that, it might be true. Like mm. I might speak the truth, but it's often exaggerated, you know, but I might speak the truth and then people be like, I don't like what you said. Well, it doesn't make it not true. You know, and that's why I said right. earlier that conversations that are based on truth might – and a relationship. But the beautiful thing is they liberate everybody involved. It's like most families oscillate around unspoken truths, the alcoholic, the abuser, the whatever it is, the angry person, the narcissist, the drug addict, the whatever. And everyone's role in that family is to keep that truth hidden. You have the overfunctioner, you have the person who underfunctions, you have the perfectionist, you have the, the person who doesn't care and just nothing matters to them. All these people take on roles to keep that truth protected mm. from, from being actually exposed and held accountable for. And so when we have that saying, you know, like the black sheep of the family sort of blows up the system, that's really is the black sheep of the family says I will no longer participate. That is the exact same behavior that is when I speak how I feel, a boundary, whatever it might be, can I stand in this new feeling? which is instead of needing you to agree with me, I actually might experience rejection from you, but can I sit in the experience of the first moment that I actually am the person who cultivates my own worth by being in my values, by being in my integrity, and then my boundaries actually are designed to preserve my values, and they preserve my wholeness. I'm already whole. I'm born that way. Um, but most of us don't learn boundaries. Most of us, what we observe in relationship is the absence of them, the bulldozing of them, the taking advantage of them, whatever it might be. And so how do you do it? Listen, it's the most courageous act to go from a pattern that is familiar and uncomfortable, maybe even painful, to go to one that is totally unfamiliar. And when you become the source of your own work, when you speak truth at the cost of a system, you actually inspire everybody to do the same and the irony is that the people who resist you most are people who were taught to silence too. So mm -hmm. they're afraid of the consequence yeah. of what might happen to you. It's like when I first left pharma to move into writing and teaching and coaching, my dad said to me, can you just get a leave of absence from your job? 
And I was like, dad, that's like saying to myself, I don't believe I'm going to succeed. And that wasn't from a bad place that my dad said that. My experience felt like, oh, he's not supporting me. But really it was, I don't want to see you fail. And the same thing is when someone says, oh, um, you know, I'm sad that you're speaking this thing now, or I'm ashamed, or I'm disappointed. Oh, people loved it. You should (laughs) see the amount of disappointment in my inbox. Yeah, or my favorite is, like, you're better than that. You're smarter than that. Ugh, shame, shame, (laughs) shame. It's all the manipulation used by shame. And what I find is that the people who have the hardest time with discourse are people who don't have space for discourse within themselves. They're people who live in certainties and identities, keeps their world more safe. And the people who weaponize shame are the people who had shame weaponized against them. Mm. And really what the government has been doing in my experience is been using shame and language. Like Justin Trudeau said that people who are unvaccinated or vaccine hesitant are misogynist and racist. And what we have to decide as leaders, are we going to tolerate them? They're anti-science. This is very smart from a psychological perspective, because what we then do, if we're not able to discern what he just did, is that we've already been primed in in psychology, they call it priming. All the language that primes us is these simple statements like do the right thing, blah, Mm. blah. Um, So we've already been primed to other, uh, the unvaccinated. And then what now has been done is there's been a a very explicit um, association with them them, that language is important, they, them, with these groups that we would never tolerate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so even though we can know that that has just happened, if we're captured by the fear, we actually have a hard time undoing what we just learned. It's like we could be lied to, but we actually have a hard time believing that the new truth that was always there after that. And Trump knew this. Um, And, you know, like that that ability to place an associative group then means that now we can do things that we would have done to those groups. And remember that was pre how we treated the the freedom convoy. Mm. It was all, I, I, I said like, be mindful of what's about to occur because all this language is on purpose. I think you heard Biden say the unvaccinated are going to have a winter of death and illness. Again, this is, a really it's very destructive it's yeah. we're like observing the use of language in an abusive way yeah with the inability to have the capacity to actually observe it because we're too afraid we think well we do need to be protected from unvaccinated people look at all the science that they present on the news and all the fact checkers i've yet to see a pro vaccine thing that's a lie be fact checked because Never. when Biden <laughs> said that, you're right, when Biden said that the vaccinated, and many leaders did, many scientists, said that the vaccinated can't spread COVID, that was actually untrue then because it wasn't actually a endpoint in the clinical trial. And you yeah. technically, legally, cannot promote anything that didn't have a clinical trial endpoint and doesn't have an indication, that's the word they used in, in medicine, an indication for use. So much like ivermectin shouldn't have been allowed to be promoted in that space because it's out of indication, which they said. Mm. Neither was the the vaccine actually indicated or shown in the clinical trial to reduce transmission. So, you know, I, I think all this to say too, because I think often the belief is that, well, I must be against it. No, I think if you want to get it, get it. Like, I, it doesn't matter to me. Yeah. And, you know, it's, but you should have a choice and it might, you might be in the risk group that it really benefits you. That's a great choice for you then. Yeah. Um, it's just when it's manipulated and psychological coercion is being used that I have a really hard time. And, you know, as a pharma rep, we were given these objection handlers. An objection handler was like when you had a new product you were being trained on or a new objection came out, they would produce to you like things like it has no long-term data, that study was this way, blah, blah, blah. Wh- who, does an ejep- mo- who does an, ad- an objection come from? A doctor usually or a nurse or like someone who's going to be involved in the use of the product. And so you'll see there's like, you know, maybe the top 10 most common objections. There's usually top two or three depending on the product. But a common one would be something like there's no long-term data. Well, we saw the exact same 
thing happen with people. They'd be like, oh, there's no long-term data. There's These are all valid concerns. Uh, but what I saw was these were these perfectly canned answers that occurred in my job too, because we would get answers, how to handle that objection, what paper would you use, mm-hmm. how would you uh, reframe it, what statements would you use, what data. And what I saw was that people were doing the exact same thing. The news would embed the same uh, objection handling language. Like it's just like wearing a seatbelt. mRNA vaccines have been around forever. They've just not been brought to market. They're safe and effective. You know, I think one of the greatest signs of, of total dissonance and the ability to bring in information is when I see someone like um, that professional mountain biker who had a really bad vaccine um, side effect. He got myocarditis and he was a three time national champion in the United States. Kyle, uh, I'm forgetting his last name right now. Really kind man. Oh, and did he go on Marcus? Um, yeah. Um, Aubrey Marcus podcast. Aubrey Marcus's yeah. podcast. Kyle Warner, I think is his last name. Anyways, he did a video just saying, like, I had this, my career, I just want you guys to know, just so you have a heads up. He got attacked. And he was called an anti-vaxxer, which I think is really crazy because he got the vaccine. And he said in a video, like, he's back on Instagram, but at the time he said, I have to get off Instagram. I'm being attacked. I'm All I did was just try to tell you what I've been through. Mm. Um, I I did the right thing. Like, I got it. And then most of us don't expect this to happen to us. And so I just want you to have all the information. And he was attacked. If it was any other product, if it was like, let's say, a birth control pill or a blood pressure pill, and you said to your friend or I said to my friend, hey, you know, I was researching this, and it looks like it has these side effects. Our friend would be like, yeah, like, make sure you know what you're taking. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, actually, because with women in birth control, actually, my own, my, like, kind of, what's what did you call it? Like, having been, like, hurt by, like, the medical industry happened in my realization of what the birth control pill really was. But interestingly, oh, yeah. it's really touchy with women, and I would share about it and just share, like, holy shit, guys, it's completely wrecking your reproductive system. Like, you're not getting your real... Pe- yes, it's, it's like, right, it's, it's, it's completely messing up your hormones. Like, it's not doing right. what it says it's supposed to do. My gyno lied to my face, did not tell me any of the side effects, like, right? And I was sharing about that a few years ago, and I remember getting women who were really upset, though, because... There's this like, it's like in pharma itself and with like the medicine and drugs that we take that we've been normalized to accept blindly. If anybody challenges it, you take it as a personal offense, which I understand if anyway. You've taken it, right, right? Because, right, exactly. Because this is this dissonance piece you're talking about. This is exactly what's right. going on. It's the inability to sit with. Did I possibly make a decision that wasn't that good for me? Might or harm me, permanent. Might harm me, right. That's right. fucking hard to admit, right? Like, I had to well, admit to death. myself, yeah, like, I, you know, in my eyes, like, poisoned my body for, like, five years on this pill. And I, to this day, I'm dealing with the repercussions of trying to get my hormones back on track, right? Like, that's hard yeah. for most people to realize, I'm like... I'm sorry, though, because that is normalized behavior to get the pill you know when i was in my 20s i remember wanting a girlfriend to go on the pill because you don't realize you have no we've all been marketed to this whole time yeah and you know i interviewed a woman who's an expert in that space who wrote a book on it is it dr jolene brighton no holly um she did uh sweetening the pills okay but yeah like I'm sorry you've been through that because a choice that you just thought was a normal choice that really the potential side effects are minimal Mm. in the communication that you get. But they, even when they say how it actually works, the misconception is quite great. You know, it's like in psychiatric medicines and, you know, this idea that there's a, um, a chemical imbalance when we have a certain Mm. thing. Uh, you know, I had, uh, Kelly Brogan on my podcast, a psychiatrist. Oh, love her. And she was like, that was disproven long ago. That was just a marketing ploy of pharma. 
you know, there's something wrong with your chemicals. We have this thing that will fix your chemicals, you know, and that's the hard thing. You choose something that might have harmed you. You know, my red pill moment to pharma, uh, well, I was learning about emotion and its effect on body, you know, as I was learning more about relationship. And then I really was like, wow, like dysregulated emotion and dysregulation is really the core of inflammation. Mm. Um, oh, wow. And I used to sell a drug for irritable bowel syndrome when I first started. And I remember doctors would sometimes reference studies about how sexual abuse had been correlated to irritable bowel syndrome. And I thought, well, that's weird. And people didn't want them to mention that study in presentations. And I thought, well, that actually makes sense because one would be in a state of fight, flight, freeze, fawn, and then kind of get stuck in that. And then what does your body do when it's dysregulated? It, your vision narrows, you look for escape routes, we, we freeze, but our gut does not want to digest anything because digestion is the least important thing yeah. when we're triggered. And that's why you can get gut pain when you're stressed and your nervous system is activated and you can, your stomach hurts. You know, the first things that occur, what happens if we get stuck there? And so I started to see, oh, wow, like so much, like leaky gut is correlated to high conflict relationships. Wow, that's interesting. And I went to the doctor once and I had high cholesterol. And I used to sell a drug for cholesterol. I've sold so many, so many things, but I was like, hmm, I'm going to learn about this because I'm young, I'm healthy, I work out. And I start to study cholesterol and I'm like, oh my God, everything I was taught about cholesterol is bullshit yeah. or almost everything. And I always have to add the qualifiers. <laughs> the, it blew my mind once I dove a little deeper beyond the pharma veil. And then I was like, whoa, if that's not true, what else is not true? And I think that's the really hard part about all this is when you like lift the veil on one thing, you start to see that the curtain yeah. is, is it, you lift it on everything. Like it, it feels to me like, like I watch the news sometimes now or I get exposed to it and I'm like, I don't even know what's real anymore. Like, yeah. I was really watching what's going on. I didn't really consume much news of what's going on in the Ukraine and Russia. I mean, I read as much as I could to be informed for friends who, uh, and through friends who are from the Ukraine or from Russia. Um, and I really got a lot of information through them, which was really interesting to see the different perspectives mm -hmm. and, and then get an oil and gas sort of perspective on what's going on. And what I found really interesting was I was seeing these stories coming up, like uh, 13 soldiers are on an island and Russian boat, I think it was a boat, comes up and says, like, surrender, and they say, go fuck yourself, and then they all die. Mm. And I was like, first off, who told the story? Because, like, they're all dead. And, like, yeah. that, it didn't make sense to me. But these stories were circulating, and pictures that were apparently from quite old news were being recirculating as victims of, and again, I'm not negating that there are victims sure. or anything like that. My, my challenge is that why do they want me to read these war propaganda to tales that are shown? Cause there was quite a few of them shown to be totally untrue, but they made it in the main yeah. media. I think even uh, one of the Kardashians shared one mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. That was uh, a Ukrainian soldier saying goodbye to his wife. Yes, it and it turned out to movie. be from, yeah, movie, yeah. Crazy. Right. Yeah. Like that, that's why we need to make sure that we're consuming more in-depth conversations. Like that's yeah. why I actually follow both people whose opinions I like and people I don't like. Mm -hmm. And that has really served me well because I've seen points made by what might be a deferring view and been like, Ooh, that's actually gives me more compassion or makes yes. me see it differently. Um, yeah. And that's, I think that's important too, that by consuming things that we disagree with, we are actually broadened. Yes. So, oh my gosh. Yes. And I mean, it's interesting though, because there's, we are so afraid of conflict that there's such a like tr trend, if you will, on social media where people are like, if you don't like someone's content, like unfollow. And I'm, I'm like, yes, in some cases, if they're just making you feel like shit, fine. Like, that's obviously fine. You need mm -hmm. to, you know, you don't want to like trash your feed with things that are overly negative and are going to like, <laughs> yeah. 
trigger like you I all day. more abs and a better butt. <laughs> Shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? Like obviously different thing, right? But I think there's so much value in exactly what you're saying. Follow and listen to people that you disagree with is one of the best things you can do to retrain your mind and your body to be able to handle information that you don't like. I think for me, that was one of the best things I could, I did for myself was I just got really curious about like, you know, one of the things that started was this birth control thing. So I started to read about it and research it. And then, you know, that, like you said, opens the veil to other things and you're like, everything is a lie. And, and so then I would listen to podcasts, um, with people who I had a feeling I wasn't going to like what they had to say, but I was like, let me just try to sit here for an hour or two. I I always listen to the Joe Rogan podcast. So three hours long and just be like, can I just sit here and just listen to this and just let it come towards me? And then like, just slow down the like flow. Right. And it's like, we jump so much to being like, ah, I don't like this news thing. Ah, I don't like what this person has to say. Let me like unfollow and get rid of it. And it's like, what if you actually train yourself to just stay calm most of the time when you're consuming information so that you're not going into that like fear related mode where you can't actually think logically. And I think that's one of the most powerful things you can do as like a literal tangible, like how to do the work is like just engage with or observe whether it's like at the dinner table, like letting yourself just sit there and listen breathe, feel your feet on the floor, like just be present in the fact that you're hearing something, you're seeing something you don't like. And then you realize, oh, like nothing happened to me. Like I, I could read this and I was fine. And from there, you can have more compassion for this view, or you might change your mind about something, or you might then realize that it's okay for you to share things that are your perspective right. and for someone to disagree with it, because I'm going to you know, assume the best and allow this person to see what I'm saying and not like it. And they're going to be okay. And it's like, that I think is a really good way to literally like retrain yourself to not be scared of disagreement. I mean, that's how I personally have become like somewhat obsessed with disagreement is like, Oh, this is so fun. Like I can like hear something well, that I don't like. Cultivating more. Right. Yeah. And it's like, like more capacity, more love, more space. Yeah. You know, I think there's an, um, a misunderstanding that having compassion for a person's perspective means we need to tolerate whatever their maybe abusive behavior might be. Mm-hmm. You know, like I don't operate in conversations that you shame. I don't operate in conversations that are disrespectful or overtly elevated. I don't, you know, obviously people get passionate when they're talking about things. Um, but yeah, I mean, what you're inviting is so beautiful. This space of like, can I, if I can tolerate someone disagreeing with me, then I can have the space to recognize that it's okay if people disagree, like I disagree with someone, it's okay if people disagree with myself. Mm -hmm. And what a beautiful thing, you know, like I had a friend say to me recently, hey, you know, like I have had a hard time with your more activist side of things and I have really been scared to talk to you about it. And I said, okay, well, First off, thank you for bringing this forward. And is there anything that I've done to make you afraid to come towards me? And they said, no, no, it's just my own fear. And I said, okay, because I really wanted to know, have mm-hmm. I been, you know, in any ways not receptive to, her, to, to, to them? And then the interesting, you know, what I said was, let me just preface this conversation that you want to have no matter what you want to say to me, I love you. Like no matter if you disagree with me, you don't like how I'm doing something. I still love you. Mm. That's not on the line. So I just need you to know that. And I think for most of us, that's actually how we've been taught is that if you don't agree with something or you don't believe a certain religious thing or a cultural thing, or you step out of the rules of relationship, or you step out of the rules of life, like you, God forbid you become an artist instead of of an accountant. (laughs) Like you see all of these different rules that have always existed that are saying, 
you will be loved and you will be promoted. And that could be true of race, of, of socioeconomic status, right? And mm -hmm. those are very real things to consider. Yes. And to acknowledge all these different intersections. And to be able to live in a way that helps dissolve those things by saying, I love you. Now let's have a conversation. I mean, cancel culture is the ultimate, you know, version of conditional love. Yeah. And again, I think it's really important that people are held accountable for things they've never been held accountable for. Um, but you know, like my relationship advice eight years ago is different than my advice today. Mm -hmm. And it's deeper now. It's more understanding. I've learned a lot in 10 years, you know, and if anything, I, you know, there might be something I look back at and go, oh, I'm ashamed I gave that advice. But I've grown. It's actually just evidence of my evolution. And, you know, when we start creating spaces of uh, understanding, when we start cultivating communities that actually instead of exiling people who pay, who have made choices, that we actually learn how to engage in restorative justice. You know, there's a culture where when someone, I forget which tribe it is, but when someone makes a mistake, they have that person sit in the middle of a group and everyone tells them what they love about that person. Wow. How beautiful is that? That and makes you know, me want to cry. <laughs> right. That's so, wow. And like Francis Weller has this, I just love this line. He says that we spend most of our lives looking for belonging. And at some point, we actually have to become the place of welcome. And I think we are all being invited to do that, to become a place of welcome, which, my gosh, have I had to grow in the last two years. I love being right. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Who I'm doesn't? Good at it. <laughs> right. I'm good at it. I'm good at winning. You know, like I have it all feels I'm a good Scorpio. to be right. <laughs> right. So even when someone tells me all the qualities of a Scorpio, I only pay attention to the good ones. Of course. You know? <laughs> and I've had to learn to not be as activated when I disagree. And that's been the best advice I ever got was my fiance said to me, like, when you're revved up sharing something, it actually doesn't, it just unconsciously will trigger the nervous system of someone who doesn't agree with you. Mm. As opposed to like being in a state of like regulation and then being like, hey, this is interesting, isn't it? And you know, that's been a really beautiful learning to have compassion. And, you know, listen, almost everybody I love is vaccinated. And I think that's beautiful. Yeah. I actually have no, I don't care. What I think is really interesting is that people care if someone isn't. Yeah. And there's a condition on one side that I've experienced. It doesn't mean that it's true for everybody. But I've certainly experienced the consequence of the language mm -hmm. that has been perpetuated. And it's made me have to stop trying to convince people to see the world the way I do and rather just step more into my own expansion. And like everyone will come along eventually. Yeah. And whatever that even means. Like I don't think my way is the right way. I just think that my way – my way even sounds really trite and righteous. Sure, your path, think, maybe. Yeah, like I think my path, I try my best to have it include respect for the perspectives that exist outside of what I currently see and how I see things. And it's such a practice to mm -hmm. separate one's identity when really they're trying to organize everything into identity um from what you think and when your self-worth isn't tied in your identity then your identity and your beliefs then they can be wrong mm -hmm. or they can be misguided or they can be whatever yeah and you know like oh man isn't that relationship yeah isn't that love yes i mean gosh i feel so deeply what you are saying and i think what you've also experienced around the the real life damage that this messaging from our supposed leaders if you want to even call them a leader it's generous on 
what they have said about just very specifically unvaccinated people, it breaks my heart. And I, in my own life, have, and my friends, I have, like, I have experienced it deeply where I know people who they weren't invited to go to the family event. They're, this person, their family doesn't talk to them. Like, in my own life, these things have happened. And actually, that happening to me at first There was a lot of like resentment and anger, right? It's like, oh my God, you were literally like being from the place of like, how could you do this to me? Like, I, I know I'm right, right? Like being in that state of mind, but slowly, and this has actually really been aided through my own spiritual practice. And I read a lot of Ellen Watts. I'm starting to really study Zen Buddhism and it's really changed my life. And it's shown me how to cultivate this sense of, it starts, I think, with neutrality for me and a a bit of detachment, not in the like, I don't care, but like, I'm neutral to the fact that I've been hurt, but actually, I can forgive. And I can like release this from having a hold on my heart. And I can actually, it's, Yeah, like I don't need to be right here because you treated me this way and I, it's not real. I can't even blame you really, right? It's like, yes, I, I, you hurt me. I like, if I were to have a conversation with this person, it would be like, you know, me saying, you know, these truths, not to just be like, ah, whatever. But in my own state of being, I have expanded my ability to love and forgive despite having actually been like really felt hurt right and really like Mm. exiled isolated like not invited right like losing friends family whatever it is so many people have experienced that and that's also where I think the conversation we don't do the conversation when it gets misunderstood we don't do justice to the fact that this perspective like you said it's not about I really don't care what decision you make it's what I care about is that you had the choice and that you right. have the autonomy and the sovereignty over your body. That's literally it. And it's like, we lose the fact that I'm actually trying to get the most freedom and love and safety for everyone, like every single person, right? They all deserve love and safety and freedom to choose what happens to their vessel like this is a sacred vessel that you've been given here and it's allowing you to go on this crazy fucking journey like you get to decide what you do with it and that's like that's it that's the point and it's like being I think I I end up being really grateful for everything I go through and that pain right because it's like that's what expands you to be able to love anyway the fact that you can be hurt and misunderstood and have people lash out at you angry, whatever it is, and somehow cultivate love and forgiveness for them anyway, that's fucking unstoppable. Like that is the literal energetic vibration that I think will change the world is like literally the vibration of love. There is nothing higher. And if you can do that, not even despite, but because of what you have been through, you're going to have peace. You're going to have joy. Like everything will fall from that. And I feel like, yeah, it's just like, it, it like moves me because I, I know that you feel it. And I know that you speaking on it has really, yeah, I'm, I'm just emotional because it's so. <laughs> That's it. You know, I agree. I, I appreciate how you express that. You know, I, Francis Weller, I love his work. He talks about how he's a psychologist. Um, he talks about a lot of like Jungian work. And he says that the soul dwells in the darkness, you know, and our hearts beat in the dark, you know, like the darkness is actually this most beautiful space, um, you know, like the earth decays. And then what is born from that is more life. And that's why the dissonance, the pain, the abandonment, the rejection, no matter if it's in the context of the current world circumstances or relationships, you know, I really find a lot of new grief is really unprocessed old grief. Mm. And 
you know, we stop trying to save people from feelings that we know the value of. And being able, you know, if there's any invitation here, it's to enter that space that you're saying, you know, to enter that darkness. Because all you're going to find is more of you. You're just unmet, unacknowledged, unloved, unexpressed parts of yourself. And, you know, I've experienced a lot of that friction, let's call it, in the last two years. Um, and just like you, it's just cultivated more space for love, even though I can experience the rejection. You know, I had a, a friend who wouldn't hug me because I wasn't vaccinated. I'm like, but I'm healthy. I know. You know, and there's people who experience that type of thing not based on choices, like based on who they are and how the world is. You know, I was telling my friend who's black, I'm like, man, I have no... I had no, like the intersection and privilege I have yeah. means that I really haven't had to experience what you have shared with me. And he's been on my podcast a couple of times talking about Black Lives Matter and mm. things like that. And I was just like, I still don't get it. And yet I have so much more compassion and understanding. And we had this beautiful conversation about it. And I mean, if that's what this is, meant to do is to like realize that we are going down this digital path that is really just moving us further and further away from the earth. And there's an anthropologist who talks about that, that, that every culture sees other cultures as a failure to be them. Mm. And that technology is seen as the highest form of human achievement, but yet we couldn't be further from the earth. And I thought, isn't that so fascinating? Like, I think he said there's 7,000 different cultures and every single one is the right answer to the question, what does it mean to be human? Mm. And isn't that just so neat? Like we're so diverse and our conversations, our opinions, our thoughts, our feelings are all so beautiful. And it's just allowing us ways to get to know each other better, which means get to know ourselves. And man, I, I, uh, you know, I'm, committed to continuing to try to do that, to live on that edge, because I think that's really it. And we have to begin to remember not just who we are um, by uncovering all the bullshit we've been taught, uh, but also like remember this earth and how to treat it. That's why I think it's all the same thing. It's like yeah. a journey. I heard Richard Rohr the other day on Krista Tippett's podcast say the journey to the true self is the same as the journey to the true God. Like in the journey to God, you find self. In the journey to self, you find God. And I was like, ah, oh, like I've never heard it verbalized like that. That's been my experience. Yeah. I think that's so, there's something that feels very just fundamentally true about that. Mm. Just the journey home, the mm. return to essential self, whatever you want to call it, like the spiritual path, religious path, you exploring something, you ex exploring the peace that connects you, connects you to something else, to something that's maybe a little yeah. bit inexplainable. And mm. I think that's like what brings you back home. And I think home is love. I think it's truth. I think it's, yeah, it's, it's earth, right? It's just being grounded on this rock that is hurling us through the stars, but that right. somehow is like, it's home for now. It's the place that you are on the path, on the journey. It's the place that everybody else is on the path that the journey and like your own path and having space for the ups and downs of it is what will then allow you to say, okay, this person's on their path and that's okay. I hold space for that right. because you have to be on your path. There's no other way other than for it to be perfect because you're here now. And then tomorrow there you'll be like, way? there's no other way. And, and I, I think that journey home and like the coming back to finding and feeling, experiencing what is love? Like, what is that actually? Like, and then mm -hmm. what spirals off of that is I think one of the best things you can put your time into is to find that path home to the true, the true self. Yeah, I remember Ram Das talking about his 
conversation with Maharaji, his teacher. Oops, my light keeps slipping out here. I mean, you work. That's why I look like I'm doing <laughs> podcast in a phone booth slash shower. I, he said to his teacher, his Ma, teacher Maharaji said to him, why do you take so much LSD or mushrooms? I can't remember one of those. And he said, when I do, I get to sit with Christ. And Maharaji said, instead of visiting him, why don't you just become him? Mm. And I remember doing a exercise in a book that it said for the day, practice seeing everyone through the eyes of whatever Christ or whatever your, your again, deity might be. And it just held, it was so interesting. I was on a plane when I read that. And then I was like, look, you know, planes are a hard place to see through the eyes of Christ. <laughs> Good and place to have a spiritual so experience. <laughs> right, right. A lot of work, especially when you get up and someone walks ahead four <laughs> rows and stands beside you and you're like, order, can you just leave at the same? But I had so much compassion. And I think that's such an important thing is, you know, to cultivate more of that. Like, no matter what view someone has, they came to it from a loving place. Mm. And that's why, you know, I think of some, that's why we need to soften into all views. And as opposed to being oppositional, you know, being curious and open. And I, I remember like really feeling pushed away by a lot of people I loved in the last half a year, especially. Mm. And recently I had an awareness, I had a conversation with a friend that I'd felt a lot of friction with, not necessarily spoken. And, I, and we had a call and it was just such a beautiful call. And it was just so simple. And I was reminded that I had created stories about not feeling like he loved me as much or he was judging me. And while there might've been fractions of truth to that, like actual experiences, um, I realized that I was responsible for pushing away people who I felt pushed me away. Yeah. And so I was experiencing a lack of belonging to a group or a relationship when really I was the one who was afraid to be rejected and so distanced myself and that sucked <laughs> to be aware of. And so then I reached out to all the people I felt that distance from and I felt instant connection to all of them and received beautiful messages back. And so I think it's just a good reminder that sometimes in the fear of not belonging, we actually exile ourselves mm. and, and we don't give people a chance. So yeah. a, good, a good thing to remember, hopefully. I love that. I think that's a beautiful, beautiful way to put a bow on this wonderful conversation. Um, Mark, this has been so wonderful. I, I feel like I could talk to you for hours on end, um, but ditto, this, ditto. this was really beautiful and everything I imagined and more. And I'm just very grateful for you and the work that you do. And yeah, I just, I, I find you to be such a source of light and, um, yeah, man, I'm just really, really grateful for you being here and for the stuff you do. Well, thank you for having me. And, and, you know, as I said, I ditto to the ability to converse for time, <laughs> uh, for time on end, uh, Joe, Joe Rogan podcast style. Yes. And, uh, um, thank you for trusting me with the people who trust you. That's that's a really big deal, and I don't take that lightly. So I have so much gratitude for that. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're so welcome. Um, please tell people what you have going on lately, where they can connect with you if they want more, where to go. Tell them what to do. Yeah. So um, if you're like really specifically interested about romantic relationship things, you can find me on Instagram at create the love. If you want the more fiery version that you heard today, <laughs> you'll hear that on it's Mark Groves. Uh, and then, you know, I have lots of different courses to help people in different relational journeys. Um, and you can just go to create the love.com. There's recovering from codependency attachment. There's dating one one there's one on breakups and it's all my work is really centered around, um, how through experiences like dating or breakup or codependency, how do we liberate ourselves and give birth to the most powerful version of us? And I, you know, all, I would say all of our pain occurs in relationship and that's where it must be healed. And so it's the most important work. 
if you can be good at romantic relationships, you'll crush life. The rest of it's just easy. You get rejected by a coworker. <laughs> that person ghosted me last week. I can handle this shit. Um, so yeah. So thank you for having me. Yeah. Perfect. You're so welcome. Um, I think you're going to be in Austin soon, right? Yeah. Where you have an event. Yeah, I'm in. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm do, doing an event in Vegas with Zach, Dr. Zach Bush oh, on amazing. March 20th. Yeah. He's incredible. And then I'm doing an event by myself in Austin on the 27th. And, uh, you can find both of those on the link of my bio on Instagram. Cause I'm just saying I'm on create the love. Okay, like, cool. I don't, know, I don't know what the domain <laughs> is for that, but that's where you can find it on my bio on Instagram and, um, look forward to seeing everyone. It's going to be fun. I mean, Dr. Bush is just, Oh, he's the best. So cool. <laughs>